we started we started our sustainable agriculture program in 1995 um, with a view to the fact that we need we need access to raw materials absolutely true but if it's in our interest and in the farmer's interest then i would say we both benefit we do not both lose right gary we have here two models one is a small scale model another is is an industrial scale model Industrial scale models are very, very inefficient vis-a-vis -vis the intensity of production per, per hectare. No industrial farmer would ever produce what Sarath produces on an eighth of a hectare. And here we, 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 we come to a very interesting question because we always associate large with efficient. But I want to give you some numbers. The largest producers in the world hmm, are in the United States and in Europe. We have other large scale producers elsewhere. For every dollar of income of a, Euro a European farmer, 30 cents comes from subsidies. Now, my question is, if industrial farming is so efficient and it's the wave of the future, why is it necessary to subsidize it? And remember, those subsidies are not for small farmers in America. They're not for small farmers in the European Union. The principal beneficiaries of those subsidies are the largest scale producers. So I asked you, sir, you in a sustainable sense, are the underlying economics, as, as a business economist, are the underlying economics so clearly in favor of this large-scale production, or should we be looking at a more diversified place and a place for the small farmer in the sun? Well, let me pick up, though, with Raj Patel on the question of whether the urban consumer, as we've just heard with those statistics, is really endangering the welfare of the rural poor. Well, it's not necessarily the, the urban consumer. It's the rich consumer wherever they are. Um, I mean, for the, the, the people who are most hurt by the food price rises are the poor, the people who, who as Jan Kees was saying, um, spend a large proportion of their income on, uh, on, on, on food. Um, now, the cheapest food that, that's available is, uh, is cereals and, and, and sort of vegetables. Um, what rich consumers are, are doing are, are being able to trump the right of, of poor people to be able to access vegetables by buying meat and therefore by buying all the, the cereals that are necessarily... Uh, that, that are required to, to manufacture that meat. Um, so the, the, the market becomes a way for uh, the rich to be able to take food out of the mouths of the poor. What do you think about this, uh, Jan Case Vies, from the Unilever perspective? What impact is all this having on the guaranteeing of food if there are those out there who've got more money to spend and are shifting the emphasis of food production? There is a huge, huge potential to increase yields, not only on large industrialized farms, but certainly, certainly from, from small farmers. If industrialized farms no, do not meet yield, the, the, the potential yield that they can get from the type of soil and the type of crop that they're growing, while they have access to knowledge and technology and, and credit at, and stuff, then just imagine how much more all these billion poor farmers uh, can, can produce if they do get that access. But can you explain to a, a small farmer from Sri Lanka how he can get more out of his one-eighth of one acre? I haven't been to, to Sarat's farm, so I don't know how high his yields are. What I do know is that one-eighth of, of an acre is, extreme, is an extremely tiny plot of land. The real, the real question is, is, is not for, for farmers in his position whether they can expand, because they can't. The, the, the land is simply not there. The question for them is how can the, the system that supports them create opportunities for them to leave farming. I don't know how many children he has, but when he has children, he cannot divide up his land even, even further. So that, that is the real problem. You can't just say industrial scale farming will take over so those people will go somewhere else because there is nowhere else to go. Urban migration is the biggest problem in Latin America and it's all caused by industrialization of farming. So what you need to do first is you need, you need, to, grow, you need to grow small farmers first and create options for them so they have a choice. Uh, Sean Rickard, you believe that uh, there should be greater industrialization. Again, I ask the same question. When you hear about the predicament of a small farm in Sri Lanka, one of tens of millions around the world in that predicament, how can they benefit from what you're talking about, the drive for technological innovation and industrialization of output? No, I'm afraid they can't in the long run, and the best thing we can do for those farmers is to explain it to them. I fundamentally disagree with Gary. You confuse two things. We shouldn't be supporting farmers who are rich, but what we do know is that in order to become more efficient, we do need larger-scale farming. 
we don't make the land anymore. If you want farms to get larger, it must mean that some farmers leave the land in order to create space for other farmers to get large. That has been the history of the developed world, and that I'm quite confident will be the history of the developing world. And if we don't do that, we will be denying the um, efficiencies and productivities we're going to need to feed the world's population in the future. So you can have small farms, but you do it at the cost of um, shortage of food. Madam Cozy, uh, we're going to come on to the detail of your world development report shortly, but in it, it's talking about a new opportunity for smallholders. Now, why are you suggesting that? The World Bank is clear and very supportive that small farmers are the majority of people in the rural areas. They're, they're there, they're not going to go away as fast. They must be supported, but they have to be supported not only to become more productive, but to uh, access markets much more easily than they're doing. I come back to the point that if in many areas farmers just don't have that kind of access, which makes them vulnerable to uh, uh, large traders who come in, buy up the produce, and they don't get good prices. But if you approach uh, the whole si issue as a package, an integrated whole, in which those farmers get access to increase their productivity. In some cases, even in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, productivity is only one third of that in Latin America, and one quarter of that in East Asia. For certain crops, surely there's room to improve. But once they increase the production, you have to help them be able to store some of it so that they can have uh, food to eat when there's no, uh, when, when there are periods of difficulty with access to food. You have to enable them to be able to get some of those to markets. And one of the things and, you, you, and, you... And there, you know, you can then get into the chain where the food could, could actually end up, uh, you know, being uh, uh, sold in the supermarkets and so on. So access to markets where their goods can get value, where they have a surplus, there's nothing wrong with that. You talk, Raj Patel, about what you call the power of the bottleneck corporation, mm -hmm. these increasingly powerful uh, monoliths which are out there. Um, seizing control of all, all of this. Do you see any kind of way in which what we've heard from the World Bank is possible? Um, not really. I mean, by bottleneck corporation, firstly, let me just say that, that, that I mean, if, if you look at the, the way the food system is structured, it's you know, 1.3 billion producers at the top, uh, 6 billion consumers at the bottom, and then a handful of, uh, of uh, corporations like in the middle. Like a pinch point. Like, exactly. 75% of the market is really about four companies. Now, um, those, the, the, those corporations um, have, uh, are certainly in a, in, in a great position of power uh, over the food system. And, and you know, they, they behave like good capitalists should. They buy cheap from their suppliers and they sell dear to their consumers. Now, the, the trouble with that is that the people you're buying cheap from are, are the poorest people on earth. Um, so you're, you're absolutely, by uh, moving towards these, uh, accepting these large corporations, moving away from uh, a, s a system where uh, small farmers can, can be paid an honest price for their, uh, for their product.